Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Euh, on est content d'être ici avec vous aujourd'hui. Je me présente, je suis Sophie Elias Pinsonneau et je viens de terminer mon baccalauréat en innovation sociale à l'Université Saint-Paul. J'ai contribué à organiser cet événement avec Simon Tremblay-Pépin qui euh, va être constitué de euh, trois événements aujourd'hui, euh, plus tard dans la journée. Donc ce panel-ci, puis deux autres panels plus tard. Pourquoi est-ce qu'on parle de planification démocratique aujourd'hui? Eh bien, pendant longtemps, euh, le débat économique s'est articulé autour de deux pôles, le capitalisme d'un côté et euh, la planification centralisée de l'autre. Avec la chute du bloc soviétique, on pouvait de moins en moins s'imaginer euh, une possibilité d'un système économique autre que capitaliste. Aujourd'hui pourtant, face aux multiples crises sanitaires, sociales, écologiques, une alternative au capitalisme semble plus importante que jamais. Alors qu'on voit plusieurs mouvements sociaux qui luttent pour une sortie du capitalisme, il y en a peu qui réfléchissent vraiment à comment on pourrait faire pour s'organiser après. Mais quand on fouille un peu, on voit qu'il y en a qui ont essayé de le faire, puis qui ont bâti des modèles de planification de l'économie, non pas centralisée, mais décentralisée. Donc la planification économique démocratique, qu'est-ce que c'est c'est une proposition d'un système économique dans lequel les décisions économiques euh, sont prises par ceux et celles qu'elles qu concernent directement, et ce, d'une manière démocratique. On peut s'imaginer un système dans lequel on possède, par exemple, collectivement les moyens de production, qu'on s'organise généralement en autogestion dans les milieux de travail, puis on planifie la consommation et la production politiquement. Pour faire ça, il faut penser à des institutions pour encadrer la prise de décision économique, puis aussi essayer de faire converger ça vers un plan qu'on pourrait ensuite opérationnaliser. On voit que ça soulève plein d'enjeux et plein de questions. Euh, on n'a pas fini d'y répondre, puis il y a énormément de travail à faire pour arriver avec une proposition économique qui se tient vraiment, euh, qui répond effectivement aux problèmes actuels, puis qui semble aussi attrayante pour une grande quantité de gens. Ça fait plus qu'un an qu'on veut organiser cette journée de conférence pour entamer ces débats-là. Malheureusement, la pandémie nous a forcé à, à annuler l'édition l'année dernière, euh, puis à repenser justement notre plan complètement en ligne. Pour nous, cette journée-ci, c'est l'occasion d'amener plusieurs personnes de discipline puis de perspectives différentes à débattre des possibilités de la planification démocratique. C'est aussi l'occasion de partir une réflexion commune sur le sujet, en se posant des questions, puis en esquissant des réponses d'une manière euh, à susciter des débats qui, on l'espère, vont s'étendre à l'extérieur de nos écrans. On a donc invité des personnes qui travaillent sur des modèles de planification démocratique depuis plusieurs années, mais aussi d'autres qui les ont critiqués depuis le tout début. On a invité quelques personnes qui sont peut-être moins familières avec euh, les modèles de planification démocratique, mais dont le point de vue va apporter, selon nous, des apports certainement intéressants à la réflexion. Simon, je passe la parole. Merci Sophie. Bonjour tout le monde. C'est un plaisir d'être avec vous aujourd'hui. Je m'appelle Simon Tremblay-Pepin. Je suis professeur à l'École d'innovation sociale Elisabeth Bruyère de l'Université Saint-Paul. L'École d'innovation sociale est une école qui propose à ses étudiants et étudiantes d'apprendre euh, comment transformer euh, la société. Euh, dans, cette, euh, dans cette école, nous avons un centre de recherche, le Centre de recherche sur les innovations et les transformations sociales, le CRITS, euh, dont je fais également partie et dans lequel il y a un groupe de recherche sur la planification et, euh, démocratique de l'économie. Et c'est ce groupe de recherche qui vous reçoit aujourd'hui. Donc, le « nous euh, » dont parlait Sophie, c'est un ensemble de chercheurs et de chercheuses qui euh, vous reçoivent aujourd'hui. Euh, aujourd'hui, ce qui s'en vient, ce qu'on ce que, ce qu essaie de faire, ce qu'on essaie d'avoir comme réflexion, c'est de se mettre en mode écoute euh, de gens qui ont travaillé sur cette question-là avant nous. Donc, oui, Sophie le disait bien, on a l'impression que personne parle d'une alternative au capitalisme, mais en fait, les auteurs, autrices, les intellectuels qu'on a rassemblés aujourd'hui discutent de ces questions-là depuis des années et nous avions envie d'entendre leurs réflexions, oui, sur la base de ce qu'ils ont publié, mais aussi leurs réflexions sur la base de où est-ce qu'on est rendu aujourd'hui, comment on peut avancer dans, la, euh, dans une transformation sociale qui inclurait la planification démocratique de l'économie. Donc ce n'est pas notre seul travail comme groupe de recherche. On est à préparer un livre en français euh, qu'on est en train de terminer d'écrire et qui va résumer, simplifier 
euh, et euh, mettre, euh, rendre disponible en français ces différents modèles, ce qui est assez peu accessible en fait en ce moment. Donc, euh, il y a beaucoup de publications dans le monde anglophone sur cette question-là, mais du côté francophone, il y en a très, très peu. Il y a quelques bonnes exceptions, mais ce qu'on a le goût de faire, c'est d'avoir un, un livre qui rassemble les différents modèles existants et qui les présente. Bien sûr, il y a plusieurs articles scientifiques qui s'en viennent aussi. Je ne vous ennuierai pas avec les, les différentes publications de ce côté-là, mais il y a de la recherche scientifique qui avance dans ce sens-là. Et je vous annonce aussi qu'en euh, lien avec ce qu'on fait aujourd'hui, il y aura un numéro thématique dans la revue Studies in Political Economy euh, portant sur la journée d'aujourd'hui et les réflexions qu'on a faites. Donc, il y aura un numéro qui va pouvoir donc, qui, qui ne contiendra pas toutes les présentations faites aujourd'hui. Ce ne serait pas possible. Un numéro ne serait pas assez euh, volumineux pour ça. Mais euh, les collègues qui voudront y contribuer auront une place dans, cette, euh, dans cet espace-là. Donc, voilà où nous sommes. De notre côté, on est au début de notre réflexion. On, on sait que c'est un sujet qui a alimenté les débats et les réflexions depuis des décennies maintenant. Mais on essaie de prendre la balle au bon à partir de l'endroit où se trouve le débat pour essayer de l'amener plus loin et de le faire euh, croître. Et les trois sujets qu'on qu aborde en fin de semaine, dans les prochaines minutes, la question d'écologie, ensuite la question du marché et de la planification, et enfin la question de la technologie, dans ces trois, ces trois grandes questions-là, nous semblent des questions, peut-être pas les questions, mais certainement des questions importantes qu'il faut aborder à propos de la planification démocratique de l'économie. Je remercie nos trois euh, conférenciers et conférencières aujourd'hui et euh, mon ami et collègue Alejandra euh, Zagamendez pour avoir euh, accepté d'animer et bien sûr Sophie. Et je vous souhaite une excellente euh, conférence et un très bon panel aujourd'hui. Donc, comment ça va se passer aujourd'hui? On vous présente euh, deux panels et une grande conférence dans lesquelles, justement, on va réfléchir à la planification économique démocratique sur trois plans différents. Ce premier panel auquel vous vous apprêtez à assister va relier la planification démocratique à l'enjeu écologique. Puis en se demandant euh, en quoi elle serait une bonne solution ou non à la crise écologique actuelle. Mais aussi comment faire pour qu'un modèle de planification démocratique prenne vraiment en compte les enjeux écologiques. Ensuite, à 13h30, on va avoir une grande conférence qui va se demander quelles sont les places optimales du marché et de la planification dans un modèle post-capitaliste. Est-ce qu'on veut garder certains aspects du marché? Est-ce qu'on veut plutôt tout planifier? Est-ce qu'on trouve même que ces concepts-là sont pertinents pour réfléchir à l'économie future? Mais c'est à ces questions-là que nos invités vont essayer de répondre. Finalement, on va terminer la journée avec un panel à 15h30 qui va aborder l'aspect technologique de la planification démocratique. On va se demander quel rôle est-ce qu'on veut pour la technologie dans une société euh, post-capitaliste. Puis, entre autres, on va voir comment les récents développements euh, des technologies de l'information de amènent des nouvelles possibilités aussi pour la planification. Chaque présentation va avoir la même structure. On va commencer par les présentations des panélistes de 20 minutes chaque environ. Puis ensuite, on va avoir le temps restant pour des questions du public puis des échanges entre les panélistes. Donc, pendant les présentations, vous pouvez lever votre main virtuelle puis on va vous passer la parole pendant la période de questions à la fin. Vous pouvez aussi poser votre question à l'écrit euh, dans la section euh, chat ou dans le Q&A. Je vous rappelle aussi que nos panels sont bilingues et que vous avez accès à de l'interprétation en français et en anglais en cliquant sur le bouton euh, qui est au bas de votre écran. Puis, avant de commencer le dernier panel, euh, quelques remerciements. Merci, euh, justement, comme Simon le disait, à nos conférenciers et conférencières. Merci aussi aux organisateurs et organisatrices de la Grande Transition, euh, particulièrement à Paolo Miriello qui a beaucoup aidé dans l'organisation de nos trois événements. Euh, merci aussi à nos interprètes de la Coop Largo, Jean Moreau et Fanny Poirier, qui vont assurer la traduction de nos deux panels. Puis finalement aussi, merci au Conseil de recherche en sciences humaines pour sa contribution au financement de l'événement. Sur ce, je passe la parole à Alejandra Zagamendez, qui va animer notre premier panel sur l'écologie. Merci beaucoup, Sophie. Et bon matin, bonsoir, je peux voir tout ce que vous êtes dans le monde. Aujourd'hui, ça me fait un plaisir d'animer ce premier panel sur la planification démocratique et écologique. 
Alors, je me présente brièvement. Moi, je suis chargée de cours et collaboratrice en économie écologique à, à l'Université du Québec à Ottawa, au cœur de la chaire de recherche du Canada en économie écologique. Et aujourd'hui, euh, notre panel porte, comme je le disais, sur la planification démocratique écologique un modèle économique post-capitaliste aurait comme minima, au minimum l'objectif de combler les besoins des gens qui participent. Présentement, le capitalisme ne, ne fait pas la distinction entre les besoins et les désirs. Donc, un système économique post-capitaliste le devra-t-il? Et si oui, comment? La question est d'autant plus brûlante, brûlante que l'impératif de respecter les limites de la planète prenne de la place dans les débats publics et est un important élément de mobilisation. Or, la volonté de démocratiser l'économie se pose d'emblée en tension avec l'idée des limites. Comment poser des limites externes à un collectif autonome? Comment penser la réalisation des besoins humains tout en assurant le maintien des écosystèmes? Pour discuter de ces questions, nous aurons avec nous trois panélistes que je vais présenter. Donc, d'abord, Robin Hanel, qui est professeur d'économie à l'American University de Washington, de, à Washington DC. Il a développé avec euh, Michael Albert, Albert pardon, un modèle de planification économique démocratique qu'ils ont nommé l'économie participaliste. Notre deuxième panéliste sera Marie Mellor, qui est professeure à l'Université Northumbria au Royaume-Uni. Elle a publié largement sur l'économie alternative, intégrant les perspectives socialistes, féministes et écologiques. Et notre troisième panéliste, c'est Fikret Adam, Adaman, qui est professeur à l'Université de Boasiché d'Istanbul et a, entre autres, comme intérêt de recherche l'économie environnementale. Il a travaillé à partir de 1994 avec Pat Divine sur un modèle de planification économique démocratique appelé la coordination négociée. Alors, nous allons entendre ces trois panélistes. On va, on va débuter la présentation par euh, Robin Hannell, qui aura une, une vingtaine de minutes. Thank you, Robin, for being with us. And I think you should open your mic if it's possible. Peut-être, Sophie. Just give us a second. We're just going to open the mic. It will be, it won't be long. Now? Now I'm... Yes, I, we can hear you, Robert. Okay. Thanks for being here. And I'm going to share my screen, hopefully. Um, yes. So hopefully you all can see that. Um, I don't really think I need that over there. Okay, um, it's early in the morning here in Portland, Oregon. Um, but I'm thoroughly caffeinated and I am going to speak quickly in order not to go past my 20 minutes. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I want to start by just saying that what I think we need is a very robust debate on economic vision. Um, capitalism needs to be replaced. The question is what we should replace it with. Um, 20th century real world socialism was not the answer, as I think almost everyone now knows. There is an ongoing debate among socialists over what we should propose in place of capitalism, represented at this conference by several of us who have proposed different models. This is a wonderful conference for people to find out what have people who have worked on this for quite a while, what do they have to say? For those of us who count ourselves as socialists today, for those who are disgusted with capitalism, but demand to know concretely what we would put in its place, and for those who will, build, who will attempt to build real world socialism in the future, the debate has to continue and quite honestly, the quality of the discussion needs to improve. There's I think there are four different categories of models or proposals that are out there. One is calling for more efficient and more democratic central planning. Um, Paul Cockshot, who's going to speak today, and Alan Cottrell have developed such a model. David Lehman and Dan Soros 
are also people who have developed models or proposals along those lines. The second category is different models of market socialism. David Schweikert's gonna be speaking today, but also Alec Nove, John Romer, Michael Howard, and then many others dating back to Oscar Langa, Jaroslav Vanek, and Branko Horvat, amongst others, have proposed models along that line. A third category is what I call community-based economic visions. Murray Bookchin, Gar Alperovitz, E.F. Schumacher, David Corton, Roy Morris, and Kirkpatrick Sale, and many others have proposed visions for a post-capitalist economy along those lines. And then last, I don't think, but not least, um, Pat Devine and Fickard Adaman, Fickard, who's both of whom are speaking here today, and Michael Albert and I have proposed some sort of model that I would categorize as participatory democratic planning. Where does a participatory economy fit? Well, first, let me start with what a participatory economy is not. It is not central planning. It is certainly not a market system. There are no markets in a participatory economy. And it does not envision largely self-sufficient small local economic units. Well, then what is it? Well, participatory planning does create a comprehensive plan which countenances an elaborate economic and geographical division of labor. Participatory economy now includes proposals for how to create efficient investment and various long-term development plans while maximizing popular participation. But most importantly, in a participatory economy, worker and consumer councils and federations plan their own activities while making sure one another use scarce productive resources which belong to all in a way that is socially responsible. There's some recent work that people will be seeing, much of it coming out in, in, in this year, 2021. Overall, six books and 28 journal articles and book chapters have been published about a participatory economy dating back, I had to check, back, dating back to 1983. But recently, there's a new website that was just launched in April that has a treasure trove of materials about participatory economics, including a discussion forum and a newsletter. I would invite everybody attending this conference to please visit that website and participate um, in that discussion board. And in the next year, there's going to be two new books published, Democratic Economic Planning, which is mainly for professional economists, is going to be published by Rutledge, and a participatory economy mainly for non-economists and activists, which is going to be published by Versa as well as at least three new journal articles that go into various parts in depth. But what do these new publications address? Participatory annual planning may work in theory, but will it work in practice? After almost 10 years of research work, we can now report on the results of computer simulations that speak to its practicality and robustness and shed light on whether we can realistically dispense with markets. Second thing that, is, that the new publications cover is how can investment and in long run development plans be generated and coordinated with annual plans to correct for inevitable mistakes and estimates of future changes in technologies and preferences that long term planning will make. Third area is how do we propose that reproductive activity be organized and rewarded to avoid all forms of gender discrimination. And finally, how can a country with a participatory economy benefit from international trade and investment without violating its commitment to worker self-management and economic justice? And in relevance today, how do we propose to take environmental impacts into account during annual participatory planning? And how do we propose to go about long-term environmental planning? So this brings me to the assignment that I had. I believe most socialists should apologize for being inexcusably slow to come to environmental awareness, myself included. But I can report on two ways that we now propose to protect the natural environment in the participatory economy. And I believe with these additions, the participatory economy would better protect the natural environment than any model of socialism being discussed today. 
We've now incorporated what an economist would call a pollution demand revealing mechanism into the participatory annual planning procedure. And we now have explained how an efficient long run environmental plan can be created democratically and updated and integrated with other development plans, investment plans, and annual plans. So let me describe briefly this pollution demand revealing mechanism. In each iteration of the annual planning procedure, I'm sorry, can I go ahead? Okay, something that we call an iteration facilitation board quotes the current estimate of the damage caused by releasing a unit of each pollutant. Workers' councils then propose, along with their production proposals, how much of a pollutant they want to emit, knowing they'll be charged for the damage done by those emissions. Then what we call communities of affected parties these are people who are affected by, damaged by the emissions. Propose how many units of a pollutant they are willing to allow to be released, taking into account that the community of affected parties will be compensated by an amount equal to the current estimate of the damages per unit times the total number of units that the community of affected parties allows to be released. Now, these affected parties have a right not to be polluted at all if they so choose. But if they choose to authorize a given quantity of emissions, then members of the community of affected parties will receive credit for the damages suffered. This sacrifice from exposure to pollution is added to whatever sacrifices members of this community made as workers from calculating how much consumption it is fair for them to enjoy. So what does this accomplish? When the Iteration Facilitation Board keeps adjusting its estimates of the damages for a unit of emissions until the sum total of requests to emit is equal to the permission granted, we'll eventually end up with a reasonably accurate estimate of the damages caused by the pollutant and achieve the efficient level of emissions. Specifically, what we've demonstrated, we've literally proved it as theorems that under traditional assumptions, this procedure will reduce pollution to efficient levels. In other words, allow emissions up to the point where the marginal social cost of emissions is equal to the marginal social benefit. It will satisfy the polluter pays principle, since worker councils are charged for the damage their emissions cause, which is then incorporated into the price consumers of the products must pay. It will compensate the victims of pollution for damages suffered since members of the CAPS receive consumption credit for damages they suffer from emissions. And I would add most importantly, it will induce victims to truthfully reveal the cost of pollution because this pollution demand revealing mechanism is what economists call incentive compatible. I don't know of any other proposal for how to handle pollutants in a social economy that will achieve all these results. What do we propose having to do with long run environmental planning? While that pollution demand revealing mechanism will achieve the efficient levels of emissions in any year, that does not answer how much we should allow of various environmental assets to deteriorate over time or how much we should invest to protect or enhance various environmental assets. We've now proposed a long run environmental planning procedure to answer these questions. And we've demonstrated how to identify errors in long run environmental plans so they can be updated in light of new information to improve outcomes. The essential logic is the natural environment provides services necessary for production. People also value different aspects of the natural environment as consumers. So consumption benefits must be considered along with contribution to production when we're engaged in environmental planning. This next is a, this is a mouthful. I'm an economist. The efficiency conditions for environmental planning are the increase in utility from the last dollar spent on consumption every year must be equal to the sum of all future increases in production from the last dollar spent on environmental enhancement protection every year times the future increases in utility from the last dollar spent on consumption in all future years plus the sum of all future direct increases in utility from the last dollar spent on environmental enhancement or protection every year. Sorry, it's a mouthful. 
These efficiency conditions can be solved for the efficient level to invest in environmental enhancement and protection every year, provided we know the aggregate production functions for every year, which depend on the amount of labor, physical capital, human capital, and the amount of natural capital available. The cost functions for protecting and enhancing environmental assets, the aggregate utility functions for every year, the size of the labor force every year, and the size of initial stocks of physical capital, human capital, and natural, and, and natural capital. The fifth thing we need to know, these are givens when we begin long run planning. And the fourth thing we need to know is going to be provided by the long run educational plan. We argue that the National Federation of Consumer Councils is best situated to estimate the existence and use value people will place on changes in the natural environment in the future. That's the third thing we need to know. And we argue that the Ministry for the Environment knows best what it costs to better protect and enhance the environment. That's number two while the Industry Federation of Workers' Councils are the best judges of how much changes in natural capital will affect their production in the future, that's number one. The danger is that industry federations might be tempted to agitate for more investment in the environment than is socially optimal by claiming that future increases in production for more investment in the environment will be greater than they truly believe it, believe it will be or that the Ministry for the Environment might be tempted to agitate for more investment than is warranted by claiming the cost of protecting or improving the environment is less than it truly believes it will be. Fortunately, we've shown how results from future annual plans will reveal any misestimations in these regards so that they can be protected to mitigate welfare losses. However, plan creation is not the same as plan approval. What I've described to this point is simply how we propose a long-run environmental plan can be created to maximize popular participation by different federations and how it can be revised to improve outcomes. Taking access to information and predictable motives into account, we propose the National Federation of Consumer Councils and Industry Federations of Worker Councils and the Ministry of Environment provide the estimates I've just described to particular terms in the efficiency conditions for long-run environmental planning. We then propose that the plan created be sent to the national legislature for debate, possible revision, or a final vote. It's also possible that just as any large piece of legislation might be subject to referral once an environmental plan has been created as described, debated, and amended, and approved by the national legislature, that it could also be subject to a national referendum. Look, I know this is a lot to digest in a short presentation. What I've tried to give you is this, some idea of what the participatory economy model is and how it compares to other proposals for 21st century socialism, and specifically why we believe a participatory economy would protect the natural environment far better than any actual economy ever has, and also better than any other proposal for 20, 21st century socialism would. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Robin, for this 16 minutes presentation. You still had some time if you want to add something. Or... Uh, I am so pleased with myself that I actually didn't use all my time. I don't think that's ever happened to me in my entire life, including all those years of teaching classes. So I will happily, um, I will happily relinquish my remaining three minutes. <laughs> Well, thanks a lot. So we're going to pass to our second presenter, uh, Mary Miller. The floor is yours. Uh, do you have a PowerPoint to share or it's... no? See, so, um, if you're able to open the, the mic or something. Yes, there. Is that right? Yes, we can hear you. OK, fine. Um, so thank you for inviting me. And uh, my position, as uh, said in the uh, introduction here, is linking feminist uh, feminism, ecology, and socialism. And I think all three movements must involve the other two. Feminists must be socialist and green, greens must be socialist and feminist, and socialists must be feminist and green. Um, just as an example of what can go wrong if you're not feminist and green, if feminist and socialist are feminist and green, is the idea that we've got to cut our carbon use and our energy use dramatically um, which I don't disagree with at all, because uh, we def uh, the climate crisis extinction uh, is uh, 
bearing upon us. So it's quite right that we should um, uh, take account of this. But uh, this is often thought in terms of, of the uh, formal economy, um, uh, carbon taxing, carbon uh, trading, et cetera. Um, and what people don't often think about is women's work, domestic work. For instance, if we stop by our energy use, what about all the equipment we have in the home? What about the dishwasher, the washing machine, the heating, um, the, the vacuum cleaners? Um, ca can we run all of those? And the answer is probably not. So who will then do all the labouring that, that will need to be done? The hand washing, uh, the, ha the hand cooking, um, no, no, no food processors, no fridges. Um, who, who is going to deal with all of that? Now, historically, it's women who've dealt with that. And uh, when I see proposals for uh, ec ecological planning or democratic planning, I don't see who's going to do the domestic labor, which will become the biggest. There won't be any cars, so you'll have to uh, walk your children to school. And uh, you, people used to walk miles to school. They still do in many parts of the world. So I think there's a lack of realism about the, the, the real impact of when we, when we take ecology seriously, which I still don't think we are. If we take it seriously, the pe people it will impinge on most is the, is the domestic world because that's the, the labor of, of domesticity is gonna become very, very, very hard. And I don't see anybody talking about it. Um, so that is my pitch as it were, of why it's important. So, where do we start? Where do we uh, begin? Well, socialists are about the material life, aren't they? They're about uh, pr production and uh, the materiality of human existence. Let's take this seriously. We, we are bodied creatures. We are creatures that exist in nature. We are bodied and we have life cycles. We have, to, we, we have to be born, we have to grow old, we get sick, we get well, then we, then we age and then we die. And so our planning, our democratic planning, isn't just for whether we make cars or whether we, or what, what uh, we might want to do in our various ways. It's how do we manage the life cycle? So it's starting from the, the life cycle of the human and the life cycle of nature. What does it take to replenish, to reinvigorate, to regrow labor, uh, the, the natural world, sorry. Um, so it seems to me that mostly I don't see socialists or greens starting from the whole life project seriously. That is to, to understand the, the integration of the life cycle and the ecological cycle, our embeddedness in the natural world. And um, I see women as the bridge between um, uh, contemporary societies and the, and the natural world uh, in the way that uh, at least the ge gender uh, as, as, the, as, the, as the bridge. We can think about it as a kind of economic divide, things that we count as, as, as valuable in our society, the, which I associate with the concept economic man, who can be male or female, and uh, who can be public or private, uh, public sector or private sector. But economic man is, is often the, the, the dominant vision when people make plans and the, uh, the women's work, which may be done by men as well, um, children, um, but what you could broadly call women's work, um, is uh, that tends to be excluded. Uh, market value is, is the starting point or public value um, as against the sub subsistence, um, the, the creation of, uh, of, uh, of sustainable local economies, personal wealth versus social reciprocity, uh, the, the planning around able-bodied workers rather than the sick, the needy, the old and the young. Um, you could go on about the gaps uh, between, and the, di the difference at the moment, the main difference between these two halves is uh, monetary valuation. Mo the, the, the things publicly and privately, the things we take value of our society tend to be monetized or, 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 or um, re have a monetary value attached to them. I've no, I've no objection to a monetary value being attached. It, I'm more, more concerned about the monetary value not being attached to women's work in the natural world. Um, so 
the starting point obviously is to create, uh, is to crit critique the, uh, the unsustainability and the artificiality of what we call the economy, thinking mostly here about the market rather than the public economy. Um, that is that we, um, uh, we, th we think into, we, our society is divided in terms of uh, that is valued by money and not. Um, so the question then becomes, well, what do we do? Do we, uh, we talk, we, Rob has talked about abolishing the market, but I've no objection to that either. But uh, you've still got to have a, a process of allocating uh, priorities, whether they be socialized or, 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 or market. And um, so the question is, do, what, what's, what umbrella do we put the, the, the whole provision, what we call not the economic system, but the provisioning system, from the domestic through the public to the private. Uh, what umbrella do you put these under? Um, and I, what I've been exploring is whether you can use a money system, a democratized money system to allocate value, which is effectively budgeting, which fits in quite well with a lot of, sort of things that Robert was saying. Um, but I, I, so, so I, I'm not saying that, uh, that I, I disagree with the, the system, I'm just, I'm just talking about the feminist, green and socialist um, standard uh, is, is what we should be doing, uh, what we should be paying attention to. Um, and to, to kind of explore this, I've tried to explore all these different side of things, like um, the idea that perhaps earlier human societies were more ecologically sustainable. Well, it's true for some, but not true for others. Uh, where, was women's life any better? Uh, the answer is, in terms of women's labour, that whatever the type of society, it seems as if women do most of the work, certainly in the community. Um, then I looked at the nature of money, and uh, the, the, the ideology is that money comes from the market, it's created by the market, and uh, it, was, it was developed uh, in this condition of, um, of uh, uh, bartering, and it, this was improved by the invention of money. And that type of thing. Whereas, if you if you look at the history of money, of some money allocation, some some mode of valuing, some yardstick of valuing, best not to call it money because that's confusing, but some yardstick of valuing occurs in most human societies. So, what we need to have in our plan system is some agreed um, yardstick of valuing, uh, which is really what underlies the process of budgeting. Um, so, uh, so I've been exploring uh, public money to private money, um, uh, rather private money to public money, and to get democratic control of, what, of, our, of our money system. Because it seems to me that all the human, as far as I can see, all human societies have this, this allocation, allocatory mechanism, not necessarily for uh, producing of good, produ production of goods and services, because most societies didn't have that, but the allocation of prestige or punishment. So, so I, I'm very interested in the mechanism we use when we have our participatory systems. What is the allocatory mechanism we use? Which is the kind of questions I'm asking. So, so concepts that I'm trying to come up with are, are, are concepts like uh, to, to deal with the needs and wants problem is starting from the whole person, starting from the whole body, not starting from the abstracted uh, artificial construct of economic man or even public man, I say who, who, who can, in inverted commas, who, who can be female. I'm not saying that men are naturally uh, environmentally destructive or women are naturally environmentally wonderful. Uh, you find men and women in both in both sides of of, of, this, of that thing. Um, so I, I'm I'm trying to work well. Feminists generally, it's not I can't claim credit for this. Um, de 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 developed concepts like provisioning rather than economy. And um, so the idea is that um, we uh, we we integrate all the systems of, of the life cycle needs. And it was starting from the embodiment and embeddedness in nature as the starting point, that we deal with the whole person. And the case for participatory, apart from all other cases like social justice, et cetera, of participation is that 
the more you get part people participating in, in public decision making, the more they bring the whole person in because they are whole people. They, 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 they not, they're not just somebody in the office who come to commutes in and then has so many days holiday a year. But you live in your body every day. And if you, if you bring your whole body into decision making about your community and your life, then you're going to take account of the fact that you're going to go old, grow old and, and, and ill, or you've got to look after somebody who's old and ill, or you've got to look after young children, or you've got to keep the house uh, clean so that people don't get sick, or you've got to make sure people have enough food, uh, or you've got time to listen to people's problems. Um, so, so I would want an, an, uh, an economy that integrates the whole person. And that would be my basis for a feminist green socialism. Have I gone over my time? You still have uh, five minutes. Oh, I still have five minutes. Well, I think like Robin, I think I've, uh, I've probably said enough and uh, we can bring out more in questions. Well, thanks a lot, Mary, in that case. And um, so we're gonna be following the, this panel with Fikret Adaman presentation. So the floor is yours for 15, 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, I should like to start um, by thanking Sophie and uh, Simon for the very uh, stimulating organization and also for having, uh, having me in the, uh, in the event. Well, uh, let me share my screen. So um, here, what I have um, have partially been mentioned by both uh, Robin and uh, Mary. So therefore, um, in some parts, I will try to be um, very brief. Well, the the question that we are facing with is how, in a future post-growth eco-socialist society, democratic and participatory social planning can address the social, economic, political, and ecological challenges that we face today. Well, this question um, presupposes that the social, economic, political, and ecological challenges are somehow interrelated with each other. And uh, we envisage a post-growth eco-socialist world, uh, which is based on social ownership and participatory planning, um, which is basically the uh, today's topic. We need social ownership um, to be combined with participatory planning uh, for two reasons, um, to coordinate interdependent decisions, and to consciously shape these decisions in line with society's values and priorities. Participatory planning um, should be distinguished from top-down hierarchical technocratic planning that we have observed during the Soviet era, but also from computer-based iterative models um, and perhaps, you know, we'll have uh, a bit more to discuss on that, uh, which seek to aggregate the preferences of individuals or workplaces and communities. Um, on the other hand, we think that it should be based on procedural rationality and should be conceived as a deliberative democratic process. Here, we think that we should depart from the following four basic principles. A politically and economically self-governing society, participatory decision-making procedures as the norm, subsidiarity to be promoted, the equal distribution of resources and power according to need. 
And a few lines I think are necessary to highlight the importance of ecological issues and the points that need to be underlined. Well, the most important point that we think is of great um, 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 sort of uh, weight is that um, when we take decisions on ecological issues, they should be taken not by scientific experts alone, but also by everyone who is going to be affected by the decisions. And here we have the following somehow related three reasons. The first one being that ecological issues are typically subject to uncertainty and yet require urgent action before the uncertainty can be resolved by further research. Decisions typically have different effects on different groups, which means that decisions necessarily involve judgment. And finally, that's something that presumably uh, we will all um, acknowledge on these, Reference should be made to the importance of equity, social justice, and well being. Well, this uh, brings us to the issue of deliberation. Well, um, if those likely to be affected by the decision to be made may be differently affected and have different values and criteria for evaluating possible outcomes of ecological policies, well, then there are both moral and economic efficiency arguments um, for them all to be included in deliberation and together reach a decision with which all can live. And we think that deliberative structures should adopt a consensus building strategy, rely on procedural rationality and the quality of the decision making process, rather than concentrating only on the final outcome. And that uh, will bring us to the issue of empowerment. Well, we think that the precondition of procedural rationality, as well as deliberative democracy, is that there should not exist power inequalities, as we have in our current neoliberal capitalist environment. What is therefore needed is equalized power across the extended peer community, including all groups interested in and affected by the particular social, ecological, or economic problems in question. And furthermore, in addition to power inequalities that are inherent of a capitalist system, there may also exist variegated agency-based dimensions of power inequalities, such as the social division of labor, the issue of gender that Mary um, has just spoke about, and ethnicity. Well, obviously, all these have a distinct and separate reality, although they always interact with the fundamental structural class divisions. And we think that the participatory planning um, can be seen as a learning process. We think that this process um, would provide the active experience that is transformatory in enabling people to move beyond being passive objects manipulated by others to becoming active subjects, collectively shaping their future together with their peers. The extension and deepening of democratic decision-making requires active as well as capable agents, and at the same time contributes to the further development of their capabilities. 
So therefore, we think that participatory engagement is a learning process, building on the experience of past attempts, well, as well as defeats and failures, uh, together with successes, successes. So therefore, we think that um, the uh, participatory planning um, process uh, should be seen uh, through a historical sort of axis. And then a few additional uh, notes with regard to the uh, ecological issues. How are we going to uh, make our decisions um, when dealing with an ecological problem? Well, as we all know, in the mainstream economics, the neoclassical economics, um, the main analysis is the so-called cost-benefit one, uh, which formulates environmental problems as purely economic problems stemming from externalities that arise due to the absence of a complete set of markets and property rights. So these are seen as market failures, as there are uh, inefficiency related with such failures, then we need to come up with a cost and benefit analysis um, to make a judgment uh, about these inefficiencies. And in doing so, the cost and benefit analysis can be seen as an attempt to overcome the market failure that I have just mentioned by commodifying the whole of non-human nature. Whereas the alternative vision, uh, we think should start from the recognition that environmental goods and services are intrinsically incommensurable and thus cannot be reduced to a single monetary indicator. So therefore, um, uh, what we should be doing is rather than trying to aggregate individual preferences as expressed in monetary terms, uh, we should be relying on deliberative decision-making institutions and processes. And in order to do that, uh, the multi-criteria technique um, has been proposed as a mechanism um, to sort of address the incommensurability problem. That technique um, would enable us, that is to say those affected by the decision to deliberate on the trade-offs between different objectives and concerns by considering not just a single monetary measurement, but rather a variety of indicators measured in their own units. That's the whole idea behind the multi-criteria technique. And these techniques um, support um, deliberative decision-making procedures by providing insights into the nature of environmental conflicts. Well, participatory planning um, should involve layered decision making with those affected at each level being involved in making the decisions and carrying them out. So at each level from the local to the global, action should take place within a framework of universal human and ecological rights that will be arrived at through a process of deliberation and negotiation. So here, the sort of, um, uh, uh, the, the light should be given to the terms negotiation and deliberation. Participatory planning is therefore a transformatory learning process through which people are able to develop their full potential as social human beings. But of course, there are challenges that we should be facing with. A post-growth society, uh, like any modern society, um, will still be based on a division of labor, which will bring about you know, its own 
challenges and has to have a means of coordinating the interdependent activities of different enterprises and of considering the social and ecological implications of their activities. So this is the challenge facing any attempt to develop a system of social planning. But the proposed system that we have in our minds um, is based on decision-making through negotiated coordination by the social owners in a multi-layered political and economic process whereby civil society uh, will control both the polity and the economy at each level of decision making. And we think that, especially when dealing with um, sort of um, transitory problems, research is required at both levels, local and macro, uh, on the concrete ways in which the institutional re-embedding of the economy in society and ecology can be realized. And here, uh, of course, uh, the, the reference is to Karl Polony, uh, where uh, sort of he mentioned the urgent need to re-embed the economy back into the society. And finally, we believe that the, the model of a self-governing society based on participatory planning is a contribution to this. Uh, but we also think that further work is needed to fully incorporate ecological concerns in an explicit manner. While the, this presentation is based on my um, joint um, uh, work uh, by Pat Devine, Democracy, Participation and Social Planning, which appeared in uh, Clive Spech, the Spech uh, Handbook, of ecological economics, uh, nature, and uh, society. So that uh, uh, brings me to the end of my presentation. And uh, I hope we'll have a fruitful discussion uh, after uh, the three uh, you know, sort of uh, presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Frikit. Thanks, everyone, for these insightful thoughts and, and uh, different ideas that we'll. I think we are ready to discuss. We still we're going to have forty five minutes for questions and answers. So uh, the way that it works for for those that are listening, um, you can either write your question in the Q and uh, question. I don't know how how is the question and response in in French, but Q and A in English. You can write your question. I will read it out loud. Otherwise, you can also I think raise your hand if you want to do it. Uh, orally so we can also ask people to come and, and ask a question or a comment um i have i received some questions and i was writing down just one as well that came to my mind and maybe because we have more time to develop um so my, the fir first question that I, I'll, I'll have uh, to start this uh, exchange is to maybe to hear you hear your thoughts more on the question of scale uh, because each of you um, propose different ways in which we, we can increase this participatory mechanism in light of environmental changes and, as Figret just said, environmental uncertainties. And, and Robin also and, and, and Mary, in a way, to think about the, the role of communities that are affected by this, but by environmental change. So my question is, as climate change issues and other global uh, in, in environmental effects are so uncertain and it's really difficult to determine who and when uh, people who uh, are affected and when they'll be affected, how can we establish or at which scale can we establish uh, establish a, a type of participation uh, or for, for an economic planning? So I don't know if you can, you wanna- Can I come in there? Yes. Um, well, I think it's, it's got to do with the whole principles of what is a citizen or a resident. Perhaps citizen is too strong because that implies a legal position. All people resident in a polity, then the obligation, it seems to me, of that polity is to ensure the 
secure livelihood of, of all those people who live under their under their uh, umbrella, as it were. And uh, therefore, we we've got to think about people's right to uh, to, to life, to existence, to uh, to health, or to treatment if they're not well, um, to security. Uh, so it's 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 thinking about uh, what the principles are, and also the rights of nature. So we've, we're, if we're starting from that kind of parameter, um, then the right to livelihood, the right to sufficiency becomes the principle. Um, and I'm, I'm looking to the principle of enough. It's hard, to, it's hard to identify what basic needs should be for a community, for, for, for people or community, because people have tried to draw lists of base, basic needs over and over again. So, so rather than talking about a list of basic needs, um, I, I thought that uh, it, you could, we know when somebody has too little, and we know when people have too much. So if we concentrate on caring for the people who have too little and, and, uh, make, uh, and encouraging the people who have too much to um, for, forego uh, a lot of, uh, quite a bit of their um, extra capacity as it were, then we, we should arrive at, at a principle of enough or sufficiency. And um, oh, there's another thought that came through my head, and it's uh, that, that's gone. Um, just a second. Um, sufficiency, sufficiency, sufficiency. No, I'll come back to you. All right, Fricket. Fricket. I think your mic is uh, closed. Uh, just to uh, follow Mary's um, point, I think um, I would uh, very much uh, argue on the same line as Mary's uh, in the sense that this should be seen as a political process whereby you know, different parties, of course, including the scientific community should take uh, part of it and they should discuss you know, various aspects. And in doing so, um, I think it is important that um, attempts should be made to take different dimensions of the problem. And, uh, you know, putting a monetary figure to an action that will come up with an ecological sort of impact uh, uh, would be misleading. And that's why we need uh, um, kind of a negotiated process, a kind of a political engagement. And we need to hear people's positions civil society's positions and so on and so forth, um, so that we can arrive um, at a discussion. Um, so what I wanted to say is that, A, this needs to be seen as a political process, and B, the technique that uh, we should be relying on um, is the so-called multi-criteria technique, uh, as opposed to the standard cost and benefit analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I remember Robin. what it was. Um, oh, yes, go um, ahead. Um, the, the example of the current, current crisis shows us what's important in our societies and what isn't. The fact we can furlough people from most of our industries and, and, uh, and uh, consumer outlets, but what we can't do without are our transport, our health service, our education, you know, we, we know what the real priorities are now in a society and, and the, the market economy has taken us off in completely the wrong direction for many, many years. That's what I was aiming to say. Thank you, Mary. Robin, uh, do you want to add something to this? Yeah, the, the matter of scale. I think, uh, just just hold on a second. Uh, we have- uh, Some you. My yes. Now? yes now. Okay. But the, the issue of scale has, is difficult and it has plagued our discussions from time immemorial. Um, one of the issues with community based activity, the most favorite word of any leftist is grassroots. And there's good reasons for that. Um, the motivation behind visions of community-based economics is that people at the local level have lost, lost all control of their lives. Let's put them back in control of their lives. Um, in Pat and and in, in Pat and Fickrick's 
proposal. The whole idea of subsidiarity is basically their way of dealing with this. Um, a lot of people now are proposing we need to put on the board of directors of corporations, members of the community and various groups that are clearly affected by what those corporations are doing, but they have no say. Um, and traditional socialism has basically said, we're all affected by all the decisions that are made out there. So this is a very difficult problem. And, and it's one that we need to think very, very carefully about. In a participatory economy, we think of it carefully in terms of what federations are involved in what kinds of ways. You have to figure out who should be involved you have to figure out how they should be involved, and you have to figure out how to give them the information they would need in order to involve themselves in a moderate amount of time effectively. And essentially, I think this is probably one of the thorniest, if not the thor most thorny issues that envisioning a socialism for the 21st century um, that's suitable to the needs of the day. Face. Um, and people should always be asking. You should be looking at every proposal and asking, how are they telling us to deal with this most thorny of all issues? And what are the pros and cons of it? Thanks a lot. So I'm, uh, I have, uh, I'm receiving several questions while we were talking. So I'm going to read three of them. And, and then um, maybe they're short ones, maybe one because they're coming. Um, I'm just going to ask everyone to use the Q uh, questions and answers part of the Zoom, because if they're coming from the other uh, conversation, I, I, I'm not able to, to read them all. They just merge with all the comments. So just one question here from Nicola that says, what behavior model, if any, do each of the presenters tend to base their work on? So that will be the first, if any economic behavior model. Uh, and the second one, it's a question, I think it's more related to Robin's work. Uh, I think Simon says he has followed your work for years now, and it's the first time he hears about a mystery of environment and a national legislator. Uh, uh, are these new strictly political institutions built because the ecological question needs a more political answer than the other more economical economical question you touched before. And I have another question, I'm sorry. How can we bridge between theory and practice? So just reading uh, three specific questions. First on the behavioral model, the second one was more related to Robin's uh, work. And the third one is how can, we, how can we bridge between the theory and the practice? So anyone that wants to jump first? on this secret? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Nicola, for the uh, very stimulating question. Um, well, I think that um, we should acknowledge that um, the, the participatory planning model should be based um, on the precondition that uh, we as individuals would like to realize ourselves. So this is, you know, uh, more than a typical um, sort of utility maximization concept. And uh, realizing oneself, I think should require under the um, social uh, participatory planning uh, sort of process, um, a transformatory sort of uh, path as well in the sense that uh, we should uh, learn how to care the other. Uh, and uh, I mean, that should be uh, reciprocal in the sense that the others should also, um, should also try to understand our positions. I mean, the whole idea of negotiated coordination is to be based on the assumption that uh, people, uh, do respect each other and do care each other. So this is this is a this is a, a sort of uh, uh, quite an orthogonal way of uh, uh, positioning ourselves uh, 
uh, well, of course, I mean, you, there might be people uh, who may sort of want to manipulate the system and, you know, try to um, sort of uh, see, you know, uh, opportunities uh, for their, you know, uh, self-interest and so on and so forth. But we believe that uh, in general, um, uh, the system um, should sort of uh, 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 promote uh, solidarity, should promote uh, reciprocity, uh, and therefore, uh, and, all, and also, uh, uh, lastly, we believe that uh, rather than taking the individual as our uh, ontological entry point, we would like to take the social, so whatever the social is, because it depends on the sort of scale that we are talking about, as the entry point. And and uh, with regard to the second question, the sort of, uh, you know, what can be uh, said about the theory and, and the practice, um, well, uh, I mean, what needs to be done is to look at the local initiatives um, that uh, Robin uh, categorized under uh, sort of uh, community-based models. And there are, you know, cooperatives. There are, you know, uh, different initiatives uh, at the at the micro level, at the city level, uh, that would sort of promote solidarity. That would promote, you know, resistance to the neoliberal system. But at the same time, we should do our best to um, look at the um, reforms that can be achieved at the macro level as well as at the international level. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Somebody, somebody else wants to marry? Just hold on. Um, yes. Okay. I'm unmuted. Yes, I mean, my, my position is that the whole question of the economy and the allocation is, is, um, is a political question. And that uh, that we have been part of the mythology of uh, the of capitalism and particularly neoliberalism is that the market is the source of our wealth and, and the source of all our energy. Uh, I mean, economic energy there, not. Uh, uh, and uh, I I think again, this crisis has shown that that, that it, is, it, is, it is the public economy that is the stronger economy. That that the market economy is dependent on the public economy and particularly the the maintenance and and um, and uh, well, the maintenance of the, mon of the monetary system, the valuation system um, that uh, we relied on, and therefore the question of participation and democracy. If you see the economy as a public economy anyway, and money is public money anyway, then the question about it being uh, subject to democracy. Um, is, is automatic because the public sector is supposed to be run democratically and we would argue participatively as well. So it seems to, uh, my argument would be that we, we, we have to decenter the market economy and our, and our sort of uh, um, attachment, well, our, our theoretical attachment to it, even on, in many parts of, of, of the left, um, that, that we, we, we give too much to the wealth creation, et cetera. But the wealth is in, is in the people. It's, it's, it's the sovereign people and the sovereign people are, are, are us, particularly in, in contemporary uh, society. I mean, states in earlier societies were autocratic, but we're supposed to be democracies now. And the democracy should start with the, rec with the reclaiming of the public economy. Thanks, Mary. Um, Robin, yes. Yeah, um, I think I remember the questions I'm going to answer briefly in reverse order. One was about you know, the Syrian practice transition. And I have three things to say on that. One is, we, one is that we need a compelling vision. And that compelling vision shouldn't come across as pie in the sky. Because people are now skeptical enough about whether there is a desirable post alternative to capitalism so that they want to see an element of realism from us. But besides that, we have a ton of work to do on what I call re reform campaigns by reform movements. 
and in addition, we need also to build what I call future economy initiatives. We need to build things like cooperatives and many other things like that. Community, uh, um, you know, participatory budgeting, cooperatives. These are all examples by which we learn how to do things and by which we demonstrate to others that we really do have things that, that do work better. Second thing, um, I think the main issue that socialism failed to address successfully in the 20th century was how to give workers and citizens in their communities um, control over their own decisions and their own activities. And so when I look at proposals, I want to see new workers have a great deal of autonomy over what they do. Now, somehow you have to make sure that what they do is socially responsible. But that's why I feel it's very important, for instance, not to, I want workers to be able to talk about what they want to do and not to have to have a whole bunch of people outside the workplace sitting on the board and pinging on that conversation even before they have it amongst themselves. Um, the third thing is, well, how realistic are you going to be um, and how sort of visionary are you going to be? And partly because market socialists became so dominant, you know, starting in 1990, um, we went out of our way to label ourselves as market abol abolitionists because we thought there had been such an overwhelming reaction to the failure of the of the, of the centrally planned economies that you know socialists were throwing all caution to the wind about what it is that markets bring us. Um, so in some sense, we've been characterized as being the most way out there. They're a market abolitionist. They don't think there's any role for markets at all. Well, there was a reason for that. And I think that practically you can't, uh, and, and I'll still defend that position that we don't need them. On the other hand, we also try and make proposals that are close to things that exist in the real world, which is why I would talk about, for instance, the Ministry for the, for the Environmental Affairs. I mean, we have a ministry for, <laughs> we have ministries like that in the United States at the national level and the state level and even in city governments. So I, I do think that we need to recognize that there are institutions out there that can, we can talk about when talking with people. Um, that, are perfect, that are important institutions that would have to be used in the future economy. The last thing is the most theoretical. It's like, well, what's your model of human behavior? And this is very interesting. On the one extreme, you have Thorsten Veblen, who basically tells us that we are such creatures of habit. And the whole idea of rational decision-making is silly. On the other hand, you have the entire economics profession that has basically built its theoretical model you know, on people maximizing their utility. Um, and I think that this has been something that has plagued non-economists and leftists and economists for a long time. I actually use the rational maximizing utility maximizer model. Not because I think people behave that way. I mean, I'm a very irrational person. I'm well aware of that. I have no idea what I'm going to buy when I go into a store. I don't even go into stores most of the time. On the other hand, there is a purpose for that. And that is, if you want to predict, if you want to design an institution to figure out what will the implications of that institution be, I think it is useful to say, well, more or less, the behavior that an institution will generate on average, how would you predict if I have an institution how will people behave in response to it? If I don't see what the choice is other than to say, well, if people behave rationally, when you put them in that situation, if they behave rationally, what would they do? So that's the sense in which I find that model, one that has a use to it. And the use to it is not based on the fact that I think people actually behave that way much of the time, or that we should behave that way much of the time. Thanks a lot, Robin. So just to tell everyone that already conversations going on, I saw Fikret answering some questions directly. So if you want to look at that and also on the comments, 
pour tous ceux et celles qui demandent pour les présentations PowerPoint, euh, les, le Zoom en ce moment il est enregistré, je voulais juste le dire. Fait que si vous avez besoin de revoir que ce soit des... Euh, réécouter et revoir les, les présentations, vous, vous allez avoir accès à ceci. Um, I'm just gonna, we have some questions in, in French and English coming in, and uh, I'm just going to read them in French because sometimes it's better than just me trans, trying to translate them. So uh, for the presenters, just to use that translation uh, button. So the, la, la question, c'est... Qu Qu'est-ce qu que vous pensez des partis politiques des gauches qui ne prennent pas position radicalement sur ces enjeux? Est-ce qu'il faut éviter d'utiliser des mots comme socialisme, par exemple, pour rejoindre plus de personnes dans ces luttes? Uh, so that's a question on political parties positioning. And um, then I have a question on, thank you all for your presentation. How can we achieve to establish a local participatory democracy and economy in a world where democracy, even in the West, is threatened. So it's, it's the, the threats to democracy. Uh, so the first one's on the political party positioning and the second one is on the future of democracy in the, in the West. Does anybody want to speak it? Or I just, whoever. <laughs> yes, uh, let, let me start. Um, well, I mean, obviously, the uh, the hegemony of neoliberalism is so strong that you know it's uh, it's rather difficult for the uh, leftist party to come up with alternative uh, sort of um, models, alternative um, approaches, and 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 models. And that's precisely why we need uh, solidarity economies uh, be flourished um, at both local and uh, macro levels. That's so important. And uh, I strongly um, would like to support what Robin said about you know, solidarity economies. Um, and that's the only way to, uh, well, basically uh, break the neoliberal hegemony. Um, And at the same time, the left parties uh, should also come up with a properly sort of designed path towards a future um, system, a future you know, post-capitalist uh, system. Unless you have uh, a goal to go, uh, then you know, attempts to um, resist to neoliberal policies uh, is, may not be as fruitful uh, as one uh, may wish to see. That's the first point I would like to make. The second point um, is about the, uh, the democratic sort of uh, um, that we have been observing uh, all over the world, uh, including you know, uh, developed ones, the so-called developed ones. Um, Well, it's, it's true that in the new uh, phase after the 2010-2010 um, crisis, neoliberalism has switched to an authoritarian one uh, all over the world, in some countries more so than others. But the authoritarian tendency uh, keeps increasing, I suppose. And so therefore, uh, in order to resist to Um, you know, such an escalation and to sort of defend uh, democratic and, uh, and human rights. I think solidarity economies uh, might provide, you know, strong uh, castles there uh, because uh, solidarity economies are those places that real democracy, participatory democracy uh, is built, is sort of uh, promoted. And so therefore the democratic culture, um, you know, could get nourished uh, in these environments. And that's how perhaps we can put the link in democracy and the solidarity economies. Thank you. It's secret, somebody else that wants to react to those questions. Mary, is that? Uh, yes. I'm myself, yes. Um, yes, I've toyed with the idea of Uh, with the problem of using the word socialism has become discredited. And, uh, and I've, I, I've tended to use public economy 
rather than socialism because of the connotations. Now, the trouble with the, the, a non-democratic public economy is that if the, if the left doesn't make the case for the public economy, which I think they're very hesitant of doing so because they're seen as statist or socialist, then it's left open to populists like Trump or, 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 or um, um, Johnson to, uh, to harness the power of the state and seem as if they're bringing something to the grassroots. They've, they've, they've claimed the socialist ground, really, the, the left's ground. Uh, and the irony is that the right wing can get away with implementing very left wing policies, what would be seen as left wing policies, that if, if the left had done it, they would have been crucified um, uh, uh, in the field of public opinion. They would be uh, hounded. So when it comes to the massive bailouts, for instance, that we've had um, for, the, for the pandemic, then the, the, the right wing being in power in Britain hasn't been questioned, whereas I'm sure a Labour government would have been, would have been hammered. So perhaps we need to stand up for socialism. Perhaps we need to speak its name proudly to, to otherwise we get overtaken on a kind of right-wing platform that, that scoops the pool of the voice of the man in the street. Or, um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm conflicted about it, really. I mean, whether we should take the short-term view of saying it doesn't get us very far or saying the long-term view that we have to reclaim the, 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 the democratic economy for the left. Uh, as opposed to the kind of public economy of the right. Thank you, Mary. Robin? Yeah, briefly on, on the question of parties, this, I, I would say this is a, this is a, this is a question where, where all politics is local. In Ireland right now, their new wonderful, wonderfully democratic system of voting, um, the approach to political parties, I think, should be entirely different than in the United States, where we, we, have a, we have a system we operate under which so discriminates against third parties being able to grow and, do, and, and accomplish things effectively without becoming spoilers, that, that you really do have to look at what it is that political parties really have to be very, very aware of what the electoral system is that's in place in which they function. Um, and one of the things that surprised me when I was consulting in Venezuela in the early 2000s, um, I was surprised. I went down there to consult about their economic initiatives. And yet their priority was on rewriting their constitution. And in Chile right now, the priority amongst leftists and progressives of rewriting their constitution. And that just sort of struck me as odd. And then I realized, well, you're coming at this from a traditional old man political economy mindset, where you think, well, they're just avoiding the real issues, reforming the economy, and they're re rewriting a constitution. Who needs to do that? Um, sometimes that actually is, you know, the important thing to do in order to establish a structure in which you can have sort of democratic progress of any kind. Um, in the United States, on the question of whether we use the word socialism, it depends on the country. Um, Mike Albert and I had this debate, and I'm glad Mike won. I wanted to call our proposal participatory socialist economy. And he said, why do we have to add the word socialist? It's a thoroughly participatory economy. Why don't we just call it a participatory economy? Um, I think that actually was a wise choice when we made. But in the United States, the word socialism has been a dirty word for so long, compared to Europe, for instance, compared to the rest of the world. Although that's changing. For almost my entire active political life, we didn't have any sort of large party of any kind that call itself socialist. And yet in the last five years, Democratic Socialists of America has become a very large organization with chapters in a lot of places. So there is a new younger generation in the United States that doesn't look at the word socialism and basically cringe. And it doesn't become, and it cannot be successfully equated with 
authoritarian communism the way that it was in the United States throughout most of the 20th century. So these things are just, you got to be smart about these things. You have to be sensitive. You shouldn't. I, I think the mistake is when you dig in your ideological, you know, you dig in your ideological heels and try and sort of stick to something um, contrary to the evidence of whether or not it's being effective. Thanks a lot. I'm going to read uh, three more. So maybe this can help us out with either summer. We'll still have 50 minutes. So we'll see where we go if it's uh, too extensive or, or we have uh, uh, time for more questions. So I had a question in French on the multi criteria analysis that I, I, I don't know if what answer. So the, in French, it's written Les techniques multicriteurs sont des instruments très puissants pour mettre aux citoyens, euh, permettre aux citoyens pardon, de négocier entre entre eux, les objectifs et les moyens de politique publique. Toutefois, ces techniques multicritères sont lourdes à opérationnaliser. Les citoyens les trouvent souvent fastidieuses et c'est bon, désengagé de l'opération. Donc, connaissez-vous des solutions pour surmonter ces problèmes? And related to this question on the technicalities of, of participatory methodology, um, so I, there's a, another one here. I think I share your view that planning should be more than a mere aggregation of preferences, but I guess uh, there's, it's more a comment. I guess I don't see what utilize, utilizing computers per se as a tool in the planning process has to do with that. I also think that aggregating preference is still an important piece of information for social actors to have, even if not the only thing we might want to or want our planning process to do. And so this is more on a comment on, on the creation of preferences. Uh, maybe I'm going to ask because I, I feel like an echo. So Robin, I think your mic or Mary, your your mic is on. And this okay. And um, maybe this other this is more of a question. The third one. So in order to stay inside planetary boundaries, would there be a need to plan individual consumption? If so, how could that be taken into account? Also, do all the computers need to plan an entire economy could, could be compatible with planetary boundaries? So our question is first on the technicalities of participatory methods such as multi-criteria analysis. The other one is a comment on the aggregation of utility and the use. It's more the use of the tools. I think they're all in common. So I don't know who else. Uh, Fikret. Well, I think that's a very... Um relevant question. I mean, uh, how are we going to use the multi-criteria technique, uh, especially on an issue that requires technical knowledge? Um, isn't it, you know, a difficult task to do? Um, yes and no. I mean, yes, in the sense that uh, we need to, uh, you know, as citizens, as uh, sort of uh, civil society members, we need to know, you know, um, aspects of the problem that we are dealing with. And that's exactly where um, technical experts will enter into the picture. Um, you know, they should be there to provide us technical information. Well, there are examples, and uh, I mean, I know uh, quite some, but the, one of the most uh, successful um, sort of uh, the geographies where this, this technique has been applied is Barcelona. The Barcelona municipality has been relying on the multi-criteria uh, technique uh, when dealing with uh, local projects that would have an ecological impact, whether you know we should have this project or not, uh, well, obviously, I mean projects will come with some you know improvements, um, you know social improvements, economic improvements, and so on and so forth, and also some ecological sort of uh, uh, implications and uh, e even at the ecological level we can't be talking about you know just one uh, item there might be impacts on biodiversity there, there might be impacts on um, underground water uh, air pollution and so on and so forth so we need to consider all these dimensions separately 
And that's why we need to have uh, a sort of a negotiated coordination among different parties. And of course, you know, that would take some time. Uh, I'm, I'm not denying that, but on the other hand, um, you know, asking people as the standard mainstream economics has been doing a contingent valuation saying, look, I mean, we are going to do this project. How much money would you like to receive so that we can go for? Um, or, or how much money are you ready to pay so that we don't you know, run the project? Uh, well, th that is something that we don't want to occur. And at, at a more sort of uh, macro level or international level uh, issues, you know, like climate uh, uh, crisis, well, obviously we need to have uh, a different uh, negotiated coordination uh, at an international level, that's for sure. Um, but I mean, in all these issues, let's not be, you know, um, uh, uh, let's not uh, forget the point of um, currently there are power inequalities uh, that simply don't make uh, such a participatory system a workable one. We need to somehow democratize power so that we can have um, a, fertile, a fertile environment. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody else wants to go, Robin? Uh, um, this is probably an issue where Fikrit and, and Pat and I probably most disagree. Um, some things are easy to measure. Some things are very hard to measure. And I'll give an example where people have told us that something we're trying to measure is very, very hard to measure. And they're absolutely right. We think people should be compensated according to the efforts and sacrifices they make to measure. People have said, well, that's very hard to measure. And my answer is, you're right. It is hard to measure. But we measure. We have to measure it because we will end up giving people different incomes. So if what you're telling me is that it's hard to measure, it's hard to figure out what any differences in people's income should be, I'm gonna acknowledge that. But in the end, you're gonna to have to do it. And then the question is, well, what would be the best way of doing it that would come closest to a reasonable answer. And when you know there's going to be mistakes, you want to pay particularly atten close attention to process. Because if I'm sitting in a situation and I think that my coworkers have judged me wrongly and have decided that I don't deserve as much pay as I think, if I believe the process was fair, then I'm more willing to accept the outcome, even if I happen to personally disagree with it. But the whole idea that there are these categories of things that are incommensurable, that we can't put a monetary value on, I think it flies in the face of the ultimate reality that you will be putting, you will be making, in your final choice, you've done it. And you might want to think in your brain, I didn't want to do that, I didn't want to do that. But you're going to end up doing it anyway. And therefore, it doesn't help us, you know, to say, Things are hard to measure. Things are seem to be incomparable. It doesn't help us to say, therefore, we are not going to do that. No, you are going to end up doing that. Um, so I do think this is sort of a fundamental issue amongst all of us out there who are thinking about these things, um, where we all need to listen to one another. Um, and in the end, I, I've taken a position on this, which is probably on an extreme. And it's basically, um, yes, I sympathize. I know you don't want to make these choices, but in the end, we will make a choice. And therefore, trying to pretend we don't have to doesn't do us any good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's such an interesting debate on the valuation, the valuation debate. And um, Mary, yes. Um, I would agree with Robin that uh, I think you've, you've got to have a common unit of measurement. 
Uh, and to me, uh, what I've been proposing is the democratization of the issue and circulation of money itself. So we take the democracy one stage back. And we don't, uh, we, because uh, if we treat money as a given, then we're giving, a, giving it away to, you know, who, how, who decides how much money there is. Um, so to me, the fundamental question is who controls the currency and who issues the currency and how does it circulate? Does it circulate via debt, via the banks, or does it circulate via public budgeting? Uh, so I think there's a stage before even these debates about the nature of money itself. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we have four minutes left, so I don't know. I'm, I'm just going to read the last questions that came in quickly so we have them you're not uh, and then I'm just going to give you one minute each if you want to conclude so we had questions also as well uh, according to what's going on in France where there's a uh, they put a, co a citizen convention for climate and in the goal to measure the impacts of climate change to how what are your thoughts in this type of assemblies uh, to ensure uh, democratic participation and some people that are thanking everyone for this debate, agreeing and disagreeing as well with uh, Robbins and, uh, and Fikert on the, on the evaluation and the incomprehensibility of, of these issues. So I'm just gonna give you, each of you uh, one minute to, to have a last thought on the, on the message that we can take home from this debate. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna go in backwards of so Mary, Robin and Fikret at the end, it's okay. Mary? Keeps muting itself up. Um, yes, I think that democracy has to be about economy. That, that at the moment, the reason people are so cynical about, about political systems is because they don't have any say over how things, are, over the detail of how things are done. So I think the essence of democracy, uh, of democracy is economic democracy and central to economic democracy must be participatory budgeting. People must be able to feel they control the money system, they control the units of measurement, uh, that, that, that all these come under, under political uh, sphere, not seen as sort of abandoned to a, auto, an automated economic sphere. So democratize the economy from top to bottom. Thank you, Mary. Robin? Uh, we have to unmute Robin uh, first. I'm, un I'm, un I'm unmuted very briefly. On climate change, unfortunately, we cannot wait for a socialist desirable economy in the world to address the problem of climate change. We are not close enough to replacing neoliberal capitalism to post to postpone the problem of avoiding catastrophic climate change um, until the arrival of a better economy. We're gonna to have to manage to do it while most of the world's economies are still capitalist economies. On the subject of what a desirable economy looks like, I think the central issue is this. You, go, you can go back to you know, hunter-gatherer societies and argue that in hunter-gatherer societies, people develop traditions of managing themselves, self collective self-management. But for 2,000 years, most people have lived under circumstances where they haven't been allowed to participate in making decisions. And we have that incredible historical legacy, human legacy to overcome. And so socialism has to lean far in the direction of making, giving people opportunities to make their own economic decisions. And the failure to do so, the fact, now we have to figure out how they can self-police themselves so that those decisions are socially responsible. But we can't turn that over to a central planning board to be the policer. That part we've learned from the history of 20th century socialism. Thanks a lot, Robin. And last comment. Secret. Well, just in uh, one minute, we run out of time. Uh, I would like to stress one point that uh, uh, we haven't had time to, you know, go over, which is the issue of um, um, growing economies. Capitalism needs growth, needs accumulation, which comes with economic um, 
sort of surplus on the one hand, but on the other hand, ecological degradation. So therefore, when thinking of uh, planning, democratic planning and, and the relationship between planning and ecology, I think we should also pay attention to how to make it sure that um, we have a different path, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, degrowing path. Uh, that's, that's a point that presumably needs to be discussed in length, but uh, I just wanted to sort of underline this, something that I think Mary mentions, uh, but didn't have time to, uh, to go uh, into the details. Thank you. Thank you, Frikret, Robin, and Mary for this wonderful exchange and presentations. Uh, um, I guess, uh, je passe la parole à Sophie pour la suite. Je vous remercie tout le monde. Merci pour ce panel. Bien, merci à tout le monde. Euh, donc, on arrive à la fin de ce panel-ci. Euh, je vous invite à venir à nos prochains panels dans la journée, euh, justement, un à 13h30, puis à 15h30. Je vous donne rendez-vous là-bas. Au revoir. Merci beaucoup. Mm -hmm.